Dear students, welcome to the NIO studio. This is Shubhodna Chakraborty and today we are going to learn about self and psychological process. When we grow, we develop self concept which tells how we relate ourselves to others, how we behave in a given setting, etc. But our self concept development never becomes constant. It changes throughout our lifespan. We develop friendships, close relations, as well as grow morally and develop self-control. Our self doesn't confine to personal functioning only. It influences the society and also gets influenced by it. This feedback cycle continues throughout our life. Let's look at the objectives. We will learn about how our self gets developed across the lifespan. We will understand the meaning of self-control and different stages of moral development and also about the various stages of pro-social behavior development. So let's start. Our first topic for today is self in a lifespan perspective. We know development of self never becomes constant. Our varied experiences throughout gives shape to our self and during the middle of the first year, children start processing and recognizing voices and facial images of other infants. This is what indicates the self-other distinction, different stages of life. The first one is infancy. Now there was an experiment which was done that children were showed mirrors and their response were noted and the results were that different children from different age groups responded differently to the images. Those who were from 15 to 24 months, it was found that they had a very good visual self-concept. Those who were from three years, they didn't have clear self-awareness. And those who were from four to five years, they had better representation of themselves. Now, during early childhood, the children can differentiate themselves on the basis of psychological attributes. During adolescence, the representations of self becomes clear and subtle. Development of identity during adolescence, which provides a stable sense to the person, his values and ideals. And along with this, a small problem starts, that is identity crisis, that is, when one fails to have a coherent sense of self. And during this time, people face very difficulties. Difficulties as in problems in committing to roles, occupational choices, etc. And some establish their identities after lots of soul searching and introspection. And those who commit early, for them the identity growth halts or stops. Now, there is one more thing which is quite much in the early adulthood. That is the challenge between intimacy versus isolation. In intimacy, establishment of committed enduring relations which includes both romantic and friendly as well. And in the course of development, one redefines his or her role as father or mother, uncle, aunt, etc. Well, during middle age, Generation gap concerns a lot and people also think about their contribution to the society. Here one goes through what we say the challenge of generativity versus stagnation. Well, people are expected to get engaged in more and more generative activities. This is the time when people also go, go through something called midlife crisis where they start thinking about the purpose of their life. They also think that how and what are they wanted to do. And this is something which interrupts the normal rhythm of their life. Well, when we talk about old age, people face various challenges. And that is basically of integrity versus despair. Due to poor physical health, lack of support, disintegration of family ties, these all these things make pe aged people suffer from poor self-concept. But there are people, those who look at their lives with sense of satisfaction 
experience a sense of integrity. And there are also people, those who have, those who have regret and despair. Well, the view of self works as a powerful force which directs behaviors and shapes interactions in society. People are expected to contribute to the healthy development of society to which they belong. And well-integrated people contribute to personal growth and development of society. We do have examples like Mahatma Gandhi, Mother Teresa. Now, we will go through something called self-control and its development. And I, I believe this is going to be a very important topic for you people. Well, what is self-control? Self-control is a process of learning to regulate one's own behavior. Like we have seen, obese people, chain smokers, tense persons, they actually need something called self-control. Basically like, for, like they use self-control methods to lose weights, stop smoking, reduce tension respectively. Now, what are the steps which one should take in, in self-control? The first one is performing a task, like actions taken to solve a certain problem. Then we talk about the self-monitoring of performance and outcome. Means, the actual observation and recording of the action taken. Means that when they are into that process of self-control, they will be the one who will monitor their own performance and also the outcome. Then there will be self-evaluation and reinforcement. Means revising one's belief of one's competence and then re rewarding oneself. When we talk about rewarding oneself, basically it is something like, suppose you tell yourself that, okay, I won't do this certain thing for the entire one week. And after that, I will gift myself something. That is what is called the rewarding oneself. Well, let me give you a small example. When a child is taught to remain calm, the first thing which is taught is prepare for provocation. Means anticipate difficult situations without getting provoked. This is something which we have to teach to a child. Then comes control the difficulty through play acting. The child is taught to confront the provocation by remaining calm and in control at the same time. So, various techniques are taught to the child and also some rehearsals basically for the sake of controlling the difficult situation so that they don't get provoked very easily and also remain calm and in control at the same time. Now, we also teach that how to cope with provocation. Now, this is a very important thing especially when we are teaching a child to remain calm. That the child is made aware of physical response, like what happens when one is very angry, the tightening of muscles or rising anger, along with coping skills are taught to the child. And the most important thing which is taught to a child is to reflect on consequences, to reflect on the repercussions, to think about what can happen if I do a certain thing. Here, we are actually teaching the child to become more reflective on what can happen in future. This works. Now, this is a very important strategy or a training process by which we can actually teach anyone how to self-control, how to do self-control. And we will focus more on something called self-talking, that is, talking to oneself and make oneself understand that one should not do certain thing. So the first thing which one should do is identify the problem. Let's take an example. Suppose you cannot sit for long to read. Now this is something which you all must go through, uh, must go through this thing because there is a problem which we um, generally suffer. The thing is that you cannot sit for so long. So the first thing which, we need, which you need to ask yourself, that is the interrogation skills, which subject? Is there any specific subject, for an example mathematics or anything it can be, that you cannot sit for long? Then think about what is that exact time when you don't feel like sitting? Then you have to do some attention on yourself. That is, 
sit for 30 minutes, take rest for 5 minutes and like this you have to continue the entire cycle and believe me you will see that you can study for more than 5 to 6 hours a day. And one more thing, when you are taking rest for those 5 minutes, you must go away from books and do what you like. But keep in mind, you have to return and focus voluntarily. Then comes the self-reinforcement. As I told you earlier, one has to reward oneself. That really acts like anything, that really works like anything. You have to reward yourself, you have to tell yourself that if I study for 4 hours, I will give myself a break of say half an hour. In this way, one can actually sit for long. One can actually help oneself by self-talking. And at last comes the self-correction and coping option. That is, when you get distracted, you have to attempt yourself to focus back on your work. And that is something which you have to do voluntarily. The more you do, the better you get. Now, let's talk about moral development. This is another very important topic. Here, one should know, see we always have been told to understand between what is right and what is wrong. Well, this helps a person to balance the self-interest and well-being of others. Just imagine if you are not being taught all these things. There may be a possibility that you end up doing something which is not being liked by others. So you have to understand by yourself that what is your self-interest and what is good for others or not. Well, the development of morality occurs through stages and we will go through it. Well, in the development of morality, the idea of other persons and perspective taking, that is, now when we talk about idea of other persons and perspective taking, we are actually talking about an act of perceiving a situation or understanding a concept from an alternative point of view, such as that of another individual, how this is going to affect someone else. You can say that suppose you do something and you have to think from the other person's point of view, that what will happen, what will happen to that person, how that person will think at that certain time. This is what is called the idea of other persons and perspective taking. And this is very important for moral development. Well, when the children up to the age of 8 years focus on simple and concrete attributes of others and have difficulty in appreciating others, that is, the ability to understand others' point of view starts during childhood and continues during adolescence. Well, this is what we were talking about that the ability to understand others' point of view, well, this starts a bit late and this grows during the childhood and this continues during the adolescence too. Researchers have tried to understand how moral reasoning works. Well, a very famous uh, psychologist, Piaget, found that younger children, those who were up to the age of 9 to 10 years, show, showed morality of constraint. Now, what is morality of constraint? That is, until into their adolescence, they will follow their parents' orders. They will follow what their parents will always say. Now, during this stage, they show conformity to social rules without thinking about the events from other aspects. Now, as I told you, the problem of perspective taking and thinking from others' point of view, this happens late. So, till that time, they show conformity to social rules. And they don't think about the events from other views also. Well, if I give you an example, suppose one child goes to the kitchen to steal a dish and broke cups while reaching to the dish. And let us say we have another child who did not know about it and accidentally broke five cups. Now, if you go and ask the younger children, they will, say, they will tend to give punishment to the one who broke five cups than for the first one who went to steal food. Now, what kind of reasoning is this? They are not thinking from the other type. Other type means they think about the intentions and believe that moral rules can be changed if there is need. This is known as morality of cooperation. Younger children's morality is autonomous. That is, they act independently without thinking about perspectives. 
if you start relating to what, what we uh, uh, discussed about the perspective taking, you will understand what I am saying. That the younger children, they actually act independently without thinking about various point of views. Now, model development starts early in a child. And if we talk about the stages, in the first stage, that is before the age of about seven, it is based on consequences. That is, the positive outcomes, which we often call good, and the negative outcomes, which we often call bad. Well, this is called objective moral orientation. The way they understand the things which is happening all around them is just through these two categories, the good things and the bad things. When after the age of seven years, to be very clear, around 10 years of age, till the 10 years of age, the children also focus on the intentions behind various actions. Well, this is the point from where the thinking from others' point of view starts. But it mainly develops, as I told you, around the age of 10 years. And this is called the subjective moral orientation. Well, now let's talk about the three levels of moral reasoning. As I told you, lots of research and work has been done on what types of moral reasoning is done by the children. The first one, the first stage or the first level of moral reasoning is pre-conventional stage. In the pre-conventional stage, the reasoning is somewhat self-centered and focuses on the personal consequences of individual's behavior. That is, they don't think about intentions or from someone else's point of view. They just think about that what can be the personal consequences of their behavior, as you have understood from the example of breaking the cups which I gave a few minutes back. Then comes the conventional stage. In this, the reasoning focuses on what is considered as acceptable moral rules. And this is what actually starts the moral development. And at last comes the post-conventional stage. It happens during adolescence, where the individual starts relying on actions which are good for the society. Basically, the individual starts thinking about others' perspective too. So we can understand one thing, that for moral development, to think from others' perspective is a very, very, very important thing. And also about the repercussions, what one can go through. If something wrong is done. So, when we talk about the post-conventional stage, uh, it happens during the adolescence, where the individual rely on actions which are good for the society, good for the community, and they avoid actions which do not. Well, when we talk about moral development, Kohlberg did some amazing study. He understood that acting in a moral way demands a higher stage of moral reasoning. Factors like perception of risk, self-interest, social conven conventions, and situational factors also play a major role in it. In children, moral behavior vary with situations. Now, this is a very important line. When we talk about children, their moral behavior vary with different situations. That in different situations, they will act in a different way. When we talk about the role of family, it actually plays a very, very, very important role in moral development. Other than all those factors which we discussed, the role of family is also a very important thing about the development of morality. Well, here we talk about the emphasis on acceptable behavior by parents play an important role as well as early experiences outside family and moral development. That is, if the parents focuses on what is right, what is wrong, what is acceptable, what is good for the society, if these kind of things are being taught to a child by the parents, this is going to be a very important part for the development of morality. Not only that, when we talk about the school or the preschool, that is also a very good, very important thing because those experiences which a child goes through in the school, in the preschool, and also with his peers, that actually helps in the moral development. According to Gilligan, 
male children are socialized to be independent and achievement oriented. Now this is a research study done by Mr. Gilligan. He said that male children are socialized to be independent and achievement oriented while female children are socialized to be nurturant and maintain a sense of responsibility. It is very important to note that questions of morality are dealt with in different ways in different cultures. Now, this is another very important thing. The way the Western society might think about something, it may not be the same when we talk about the non-Western cultures. The thing which are normal in the Western society may not be the same when we talk about, when we talk in the Indian context. Because Indian context, in Indian context, the values, the moral values are mainly based on spiritual and human dignity that may or may not be the same as in Western society or other cultures. So, the role of family or moral development and everything is something which changes with different societies and cultures. Now, we will talk about pro and antisocial behavior. This is again going to be a very important thing which we are going to study now. Pro-social behavior. Now what is pro-social behavior? When a behavior which actually is good or benefit the other person. For an example, when we cooperate with others, when we share and help others, when someone is in distress. These are the, when, in short, when we talk about the good things about the morality when we talk about the good things about the behavior part, that is basically called the pro-social behavior, which comes with charity, cooperation, sharing things with others, or and you can say that uh, working in group, right? All these kind of things comes under the category of pro-social behaviors. And when we talk about children, they also pass through four stages in this development of empathy, which forms pro-social behavior. Empathy is something which is very important. Here, again, see, you have to understand that each and everything is interconnected, the way we are actually going through this. Empathy here means the way the child will think from someone else's point of view. The child will develop the feelings or what can happen to the other person, all these kind of things. This plays a very important role in the pro-social behavior. Well, we were talking about the stages. The first stage is the infants have difficulty in differentiating self from others. Now, that's quite normal. They don't understand what is themselves and what are others. They cry when others cry. They laugh when others laugh. When one reaches the stage two, people actually start thinking, the children actually start thinking from an egotistical point of view. That is where the sense of self, that, that, that this is me, this is mine, these kind of thinking starts developing. They help those who help them, them. The understanding that they are different from others develops. Now this is the part of stage two only, where they start helping only those people, those who have helped them. They understand that they are different from others. Well, these kind of things develop in the stage two. And in the third stage, children start showing different situations. They act according to different situations. They show, they create, they imagine different situations. And in the last and the fourth stage, children show empathy. Something which I was uh, talking about, that is the thoughts and feelings of one individual in response to the observed experience of others. They come to relate their expression of distress to others when they are also in distress. As I told you, they start thinking from different perspective, from others' perspective. And this is what is actually the most important thing behind the development of pro-social behavior. So this stage is a very important stage where the child grows this empathy within him. And as I told you again, I'm telling you again, that empathy means the thoughts and feelings of one individual in response to the observed experience of others. Children, Learn helping behavior by imitating other known people. And that is the reason it has been told that whenever in front of you, you are in front of a child, you must show those things which are good for the society. 
which are good for the growth of a child and especially I am actually talking about the pro-social behavior. When children are given opportunities like taking responsibilities, role playing, all these kind of things actually strengthens the pro-social behavior development. For an example, suppose you give a certain child to do some sort of work which is suppose very important for the school. It can be any annual function, it can be anything. This is the point where the child will actually start taking responsibilities. These kind of things where the child has been told that what he or she is doing is actually good for the community, for the society, for the school. These kind of things can actually strengthen and develop the pro-social behavior development. Anti-social behavior are characterized by truancy. Now what is truancy? The action of staying away from school or the absentism. Now this plays a very important role when we talk about antisocial behavior. So what do you understand by this? You must go to the school. Then comes the delinquency. Minor crime committed by young people. Theft, vandalism. What do you mean by vandalism? Vandalism means deliberate destruction of public property or writing and all these kind of things. Something which break the norms of social, uh, the social welfare. And these are the kind of social violations. All these things comes under the category of antisocial behavior. And there are many factors related to it. The factors which actually cause the antisocial behavior can be both personal as well as environmental influence. Well, you can say both the things mix in a certain proportions and these leads to antisocial behavior. When we talk about antisocial behavior, the psychological management is very important. It's a kind of rehabilitation, you can say, where the child is taught to shed the aggressive behavior and act as if he or she is doing something good for the society. The ways to manage antisocial behavior would include counseling, guidance for learning, socially constructive behaviors, social skills training, etc. This would help the, ch the child to grow and benefit himself as well as the society. So, what have we learned today? We learned about self-control and how chain smoking, overeating can be modified by that. We basically talked about the self-talking method and the self-instructional uh, self training as one of the methods for self-control. We also learned about the foundations of moral development and at the end we learned about the pro-social and antisocial behavior and how to deal with the antisocial behavior. Dear students, I believe all of you have understood this. Thanks.